So today we are going to go through the zero abstraction. So it's going to be a long video because uh, I've tried to exhaust almost all the data starting from anatomy to management. So yeah, so let's start. So uh, this is our objectives for today. So we are going to go through anatomy, definitions, classifications, pathophysiology, clinical presentations, investigations, and of course the management and the differentials. So let's start with the anatomy part. So the small bowel, start with the small bowel. So this is the longest part of the gastrointestinal tract and it extends from the pyloric orifice of the stomach to the ileocecal junction. And it's a oral tube and it's approximately five meters and the three to or oh, the average is three to seven meters long with an with a narrowing diameter from beginning to end. And it consists of the duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. Then, and this is the location of complete digestion and the absorption of most of the products of digestion and water. And then also electrolytes and minerals such as calcium and iron are absorbed from the small bowel. Then we have the feature, the structures. So remember, we have the mucosa, submucosa, mascaris. So we have the inner, outer. So these are the layers of the muscles. Then also we have the serosa. Then this is the features for the villi for the villi. Okay. So we move on to the breast supply of the breast supply lymphatic drainage and innervation. So the arterial supply from the branches of the spirum is enteric artery. Then the lowest part of the ileum is also supplied by the idiocortic artery. Then the veins, they correspond to the branches of the spirum's enteric artery and drain into the spirum's enteric vein. So by meaning, so you, you find that there will be a lot of correspondence to the branches of the artery. So it means they just have the same names. That's why it, what it means. Then the lymph drainage, the lymph vessels pass through the main intermediate mesenteric nodes and finally reach the spirum's enteric nodes which are situated around the origin origin of the spirum is enteric artery that's the lymph drainage then innervation the nerves are derived from the, lympha, the, the sympathetic and parasympathetic or vagus nerves from the spirum is enteric plexus then we have now the large intestine so it extends from the iliocortic junction to the anus then we have the length which is 1.5 meters in length and it is divided into four segments you have the cecum or the blind pouch then you have the colon then in the colon of course you have the ascending transverse and descending colon then you have the rectum and the anus the function of the large, large intestine we have the it's lubricates, lubrication of feces by mucus absorption of water salts and other solids bacterial flora of colon synthesis synthesizes vitamin b also have muco mucoid secretion of colon is, which is rich in antibodies of iga group which protects it from invasion by microorganisms then the microvilli of some columnar cells serve a sensory function so this is the structure for the so we have this common this take note of the ostra And uh, the tenia cora, tenia cora, hepatic fish, uh, fracture. Yeah, so this is the cecum, the ascending colon, transverse colon, and the descending colon, sigmoid colon, rectum, anus. Yeah, so this is a recap of the same features. So we can pause on this one since we talked of the same one. So this is just the same. So this is why the special features we are talking about the tenia cora, thickening of the intestinal muscularis, the ostra. The, yeah so we move on to the blood supply and innovation so these uh, slides particularly is bulky because we talk about the innovation blood supply and the lymphatic drainage of the large intestine so the cecum its arteries are well, the anterior and posterior cecal arteries from the iliocoric artery which is a branch of the superior mesenteric artery and the veins correspond to the arteries as well and they drain into the spirum's enteric vein. 
Then the lymph drainage, the lymph vessels pass through the pass through several mesenteric nodes and finally reach the superior mesenteric nodes. And we have nerve supply, nerve supply from the branches of the of the sympathetic and parasympathetic vagus nerves, from which the mesenteric plexus forms. Then we have the ascending colon, which has its arteries from the iliocoric and the light coric branches of the superior mesenteric artery. And the veins, same as cecum, so just go back here, so we have the same veins. Then the lymph vessels drain into the lymph nodes lying along the course of the coric uh, blood vessels and ultimately reach the superior mesenteric nodes. Then the nerve supply is from the sympathetic and parasympathetic, which is the vagus nerves, from the superior mesenteric plexus. Then the transverse colon, its arteries are from the, so for the transverse colon, it is going to be divided in two thirds. So the first two thirds, which is the proximal two thirds, they are supplied by, they are supplied by the middle coric artery, and the middle coric artery is a branch of the superior mesenteric artery. Whilst the distal third is going to be supplied by the left coric artery and which the left coric artery is a branch of the inferior mesenteric artery so so take note of that the, the two, three thirds then the first two thirds spiro then the last with the distal third is for the inferior then the veins correspond to the arteries and drain into the spiro mesenteric artery spiro mesenteric veins sorry then the descending colon we have arteries which we supply blood we have the left coric and the sigmoid uh, branches of the inferior mesenteric artery and the veins correspond to the arteries and drain into the mesenteric inferior mesenteric vein then the sigmoid colon we have arteries such as the sigmoid arteries of the inferior mesenteric artery and the veins drain into the inferior mesenteric vein which joins the portal venous system and uh, the lymph drains in two nodes along the course of the sigmoid arteries then from these nodes the lymph, the lymph travels to the inferior mesenteric nodes then we have, of course we have the rectum which is the last part then the arteries we have the superior the middle and inferior rectal arteries then the veins this was supposed to be veins correspond to the arteries then the superior rectal veins is a tributary of the Photo secretions and drains into the inferior mesenteric vein. So we can pause this bit. Now we can pause on the, on this slide so that we go through and and smooth the data and what we've talked about because this is where they get most of the uh, anatomy anatomy questions on intestinal obstru intestinal obstruction. So they want you to know this. Okay. So the definitions now for the conditions. So these are the terminologies we will be able to see. So intestinal obstruction is when the distal, is when the intestinal content fails to move distally. Or you can also define it as failure to propel intestinal contents from the proximal part to the distal part of the intestines. Then we have intussusception, which is defined as the prolapse of proximal segment. Of intestine of intestine into rumen of the distal or adjoining segment. Okay, so other other definitions we have we have constipation, which is inability to open bowels more than once, uh, more than once a week can be. So this same constipation can be relative or absolute. So relative meaning constipation with fetus only or absolute with no fit no fetus. So other people even term it as obesity patient. Then we have coric pain. So coric pain is an acute abdominal pain. So this is uh, very common. So coric pain is an acute abdominal pain, characteristic intermittent uh, visceral pain with fluctuations corresponding to the smooth muscle peristalsis. Then we have vovulus, which is twisting or rotation of the intestinal loops around itself and the mesentery that it's attached. Then we have examples of vovirus, we have sigmoid vovirus and sicovovirus. So this is one of the examples. This is in a sigmoid vovirus. And then we have strangulation, which is ischemia of a 
intestinal segment due to external compression. Then we have paradis gyrus, which is a loss, loss of loss or lack of peristaltic activity due to neurogenic uh, failure. That's paradis gyrus. Okay. So we are now going to classify. So there are a lot of classification. So these are some. These are just some of them uh, I managed to uh, put. So classification number one. So classification one, depending on the each each pathological or each orange. Then we have one, you can say dynamic or mechanical. So present there is presence of peristosis here. Then we have a dynamic or non-mechanical or absence of peristosis. So on dynamic or mechanical which means there is some obstruction. Uh, there's some obstruction. Then here there's no obstruction, just uh there's I, it's, it's non mechanical. And then you also have to note that the obstruction may be complete the, where there is total blockage of the lumen or incomplete where there is partial blockage. Okay, so this is the table. So for dynamic and a dynamic, so let me start with a, a dynamic where there is this is non mechanical. So we have uh, cessation of peristosis, e.g., paralytic areas, acalasia, menga esophagus, menga colon, postoperative period. And then we have the electrolyte imbalance, which can cause a, a dynamic obstruction, spinal injuries, uremia, diabetic meritus, retroperitoneal hematomas and surgeries. We also have renal surgeries, we have mesenteric ischemia or mesenteric vascular obstruction. Also have pseudo obstruction. Okay. Then of course they start with the dynamics. So dynamic is classified in two three. We have interaluminal, which is within the within lumen or in the lumen. We also have intramural, which is in the O, then extramural outside the O. Then in intraluminal we have fecal impaction. And I've also seen a patient with a charcoal impaction. So they were ingesting charcoal. So they developed charcoal impaction. So of course, I wanted to share that with you. So the fecal impaction, hook infestation, roundworm, such as Ascari, Ascaris, Lumbricoides, Bezoas, such as Trichobezoa, Phytobezoa, and other sub-examples include air and in, 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 in digestion. You also have gallstones, meconium areas, and fallen body. That's inside the lumen. Then we have a intramural. We have tuberculosis, stricture, Crohn's disease, malignancy, or carcinoma, and atresia. Then extra lumen, extra room, extramural. Outside the O, we have ovirus, interception, congenital band, obstructedemia, meconium diverticulum with band, and you also have adhesions. So these are some of the classifications. Okay. So that's how it's classified. So dynamic and dynamic, then dynamic, intramural, extramural, intraromin. Okay. Then classification number two, depending on type, or also quite depending on duration or onset of obstruction. So we have acute, which is common in small bowel, and there is a rapid onset of severe symptoms. We have chronic, which is starts as gradual, subtle. Or insidious and it's also common in carcinoma of red bowels. Then also have acute and chronic, which is common in large bowel, then it's also gradual, starts as gradual, then complete. So a chronic obstruction that suddenly becomes complete. Then we have closed group obstruction, which is specific type of obstruction in which two points along the coast of a bowel are obstructed at a single location, thus forming a closed loop like uh, this example in the picture then this is classification number two then classification number three depending on site or anatomical site of obstruction you can either have small bowel obstruction which is high or large bowel obstruction for low so site of obstruction can be duodenal or and jejunum and some of the causes of duodenal and jejunum are congenital ripomas uh areomyoma malignance bands and digestion then examples if it's the distal small bowel or the ilium, we have TB strictures, malignance, Crohn's, gallstones, areas, which is the common com common cause, roundworm, congenital as well. Then we have the large bowel. Anywhere in the large bowel we can have malignance, 
TB structure and a rectum of machine vulvaris congenital megacolon bends. Then we also have other clinical features which, is, which we might have if it's proximal small bowel, we can have severe vomiting, dehydration, no or less distension or colic pain. We can have uh, distal small bowel clinical features we have central distension, vomiting, dehydration, central abdominal pain, uh, constipation, distension, AD for AD, then the late we have vomiting. And then also there's lesser pain here. Then special features when pre X-ray, if it's proximal small bowel, we have valve conventus. If it's the distal small bowel, we have characteristic central fluid levels. We also have dilatation and ostracations in large bowel. So there's just something to note: adhesions and areas are most common causes of intestinal obstruction. Then among the two. Uh, adhesions are the most common so that's the example then we have classification number four so this is classification according to whether they are congenital or acquired so we have congenital or acquired then congenital we have anorectal malformations congenital medical colon also known as Ashbrank's disease we have adhesions duodenal atresia intestinal at intestinal atresia uh, bands or and bands and or adhesions, malrotation, valvular neonatalum, and also have acquired such as enya, which is the most common here. Then we have postoperative interception, we have roundworm, we have gallstones, tuberculosis, malignance, interception. Then we have, depending on the nature or blood supply. We have simple obstruction. So the breast supply is she's not impaired, even though the bowel is closed. So this is simple. Then strangulated, we have breast supply which is impaired since the bowel is closed or blocked. So this is classification depending on the nature or breast supply, simple or strangulated. Then the pathophysiology for this is we have the proximal gut face starts to dilate. So that's the first thing. Then intestinal obstruction they increases peristosis, which is a vigorous peristosis, which leads to obstruction due to the same continued uh, peristosis. And it reaches a point where peristosis ceases since it's like the obstruction is just continuing. Then peristosis is going to cease, so there will be flaccidity, which will also lead to para paralysis and, of course, dilation di as well. The distension of the proximal gut is caused by uh, by gas. There is overgrowth of both aerobic and anaerobic bacteria producing nitrogen and hydrogen sulfide. Then we have distal gut. The distal uh, gut continues to perform normally to perform normal peristosis and eventually collapse. So, like we said, there is first there is peristosis, and then it reaches a point where it just collapses. Then what happens at the site of obstruction is that so where there is obstruction, what happens is that there is initially there is venous return which is first impaired, which reaches to which leads to congestion, edema of the bowels, which then turns purple. Then later later on there was venous obstruction at first, then later on there will be arterial supply of uh, geopardy, then which will change the color now to blackish discoloration and also loss of peristosis. Which will lead to gangrene, perforation, will occur. There will also be translocation of bacteria and toxins into the peritoneum, which will lead to peritonitis and eventually can lead to uh, septic shock. So, this is something to note of the fluid made up of various digestive uh, juices. So, for the fluid, we have saliva, which is 100 ml per day, we have gastric secretion, which is 2000 ml per day, we have bowel, which is 1000 ml per day. Pancreatic uh, secretions, 1,000 ml per day, and secus entericus, which is 3,000 ml per day. So these are some of the MCQ notes you can take, take, take note of. Okay, then clinical features, we have the four cardinal features, which is abdominal pain, vomiting, constipation, and distension. So abdominal pain, central is abdom small bowel, then peripheral is large bowel. Then colic in nature, then it is intermittent, 5 to 10 minutes. 
Then vomiting, there is reverse peristalsis of the stomach, bowel, fecal and thrust. Then frequent vomiting is jejunal obstruction. You have blood, gangrene and hemorrhage. That's for if you have blood, then to show you that there is gangrene and hemorrhage. Then distension, also central is idio, peripheral is uh, large bowel, then localized is sigmoid vervulus. Then constipation, you can have relative or absolute or obstipation like we said earlier. This is a severe form of constipation where a person cannot pass to or gas. Then we have signs which include general signs such as dry skin, sunken eyes, low urine output, feeble pulse. Then also have the abdominal findings such as distension, visible peristalsis, tympanic on uh, percussion. Then we have auscultation, there's loud noise, uh, intestinal sounds, also termed as uh, boborygium. Then we have anya orifice should be examined as in you should be examined for any orifice since you said they are most common then we have other signs we have rebound tenderness peristos peritonitis for peritonitis so if you have rebound ten tenderness te uh, you have to suspect some peritonitis there so we also have absent bowel sounds which is a hideous. then we have continuous pain for strangulation and other other signs such as the cardiac tenderness and fever and acidosis. Then you have septic shock. Where so for septic shock, if there is septic shock, of course you are going to find fever, hypothermia, and other features, other features such as renal failure and respiratory failure due to some septic shock. And then features of strangulation are going to be the so if there is strangulation, there will be continuous severe pain, shock, tenderness, and the guarding. Rigidity, absent bowel sound, so these are some of the features of strangulation. Then bowel sound should be increased initially, then they are reduced to absent once, once fatigue or gangrene occurs or peritonitis. Then for the temperature part, you find that uh, fever is going to signify inflammation in the bowel or, or ischemia or perforation. Then we have hypothe hypothermia, which can occur when septicemia develops due to lack of pyrogenic response which suggests poor prognosis then of course uh, digital rectal examination is mandatory and uh, you find that uh, there is a normal or normal annual appearance so these are just some of them it's not always you find the normal annual appearance so you can find normal sphincter tone empty rectum so depending on where the obstruction has occurred from then you have uh, Bread stool, which implies gangrenous bowels. You can also have a palpable rectomas, which may be diagnostic. Also, you may find a palpable sausage uh, mass in the pelvis, which signifies interception, vovidus, and others. Then, of course, this is mandatory in females and uh, should be done before rectal examination. And there is even a court here, so they say never insult a woman's vagina by, by, by doing a DRI first. So if it's a woman and you're suspecting I.O., you have to do a vagina examination first, then do a DRI. So that's how it goes. So we are done here. So let's go to the investigations. So you can do brain radiography or abdominal x-ray. So you can do supine, erect, and barium with, also with barium enema. So initially, we're supposed to start with the supine abdominal x-ray, which is taken. Then later, if needed, later, if needed, then you do x-ray in, in erect posture, which is taken if perforation is suspected. So supine is first thing we're supposed to do. Then chest x-ray may find uh, free air and uh, M diaphragm. So like we said, especially if perforation is suspected. Then for full blood count, you find they may be increased what's the count, which will signify ischemia and perforation. They also, they may also be oh for for the for the FBC you may find increased white cell count. Then if they if there is ischemia and perforation you find if there is this, for the increased white cell count you find ischemia and perforation. Then for increased hematocrit it signifies dehydration, sorry. Almost uh, got lost there. So we also can also do ESR, ABD, and uh, 
the arterial blood gas might show you at metabolic acidosis which you will find in strangulated bowel or perforation then you can do a urea, urea and electrolyzed plus creatinine group and safe abdominal ultrasound your ct scan so these are some of the investigations you might hold so for the abdominal x-ray uh, let's do some background check so the thing you're going to find is are multiple air fluid levels so the proximal the proximal the obstruction the lesser the air fluid levels the distal the obstruction the more the air fluid levels so normally three fluid levels can be seen so we, we see one in, on the fundus of the stomach one at the duodenum then one at the cecum so this is uh, the normal fluid levels we're supposed to see so if they are more than this you have to suspect you have to say they are multiple air fluid levels and they may signify obstruction so then the duodenum we have to it's concentric effect due to valvular conventus airing bone pattern then the idiom is smooth and characteristic characters then the large bowel shows ostration on the x-ray then pneumobilia which is guessing biliary tree may be due to gallstone areas then distended cecum as round gas bowel in right iliac force as signifies right bowel obstruction then this is what we are talking about on the large bowel obstruction the, the diameter is more than more than five centimeters ostration these two illustrations as you can see on the large bowel obstruction so it's they have ostrations okay then this so these were the air fluid levels we are talking about as you can see these are the air fluid levels okay so this is sigmoid volvulus as you can see so there is twisting around the around the sigmoid colon and it looks like a coffee bean or omega sign yeah then of course again the, the small groups of small bowels as you can see they are central there is multiple air fluid levels okay so which is just the same things we are talking about you can pause and uh, you check so we have this plane of x-ray in direct showing directed bowel and colon is a feature of intestinal obstruction as you can see then there is multiple air fluid levels intestinal obstruction we have print extra showing multiple air fluid levels due to obstruction as well there's there are multiple air fluid levels then for the small bowel so the diameter is more than three centimeters then the distension is central as you can see this is central then you have valvular conventus you have main fluid uh, levels there's absent or less gas in large large bowel so there's no there's absent or less gas in the large bowel which is then also the step ladder sign then the triad is the directed small bowel loops then most poor fluid levels and the posit positive of air in the colon so this is the triad for a small bowel obstruction and then this is something to take note of the 369 rule so the, the 369 rule is a simple aid mem mem memory describing the normal bowel caliber so normally the small bowel should be less than three centimeters and the large bowel should be less than six centimeters and the appendix should be less than six millimeters then the cecum should be less than nine nine centimeters then above these dimensions the bowel is generally considered to be dilated and obstruction or or an, a dynamic iris should be considered if there is if the it's above these dimensions then abdominal x-ray findings how do you differentiate uh, small bowel and large bowel so diameter like we said for the small bowel should be more than three centimeters and it's dilated for the large bowel should be more than six centimeters dilated whilst the cecum should be more than nine then the location the small bowel is central then the large bowel is peripheral then the markings we have valvular conventus which is or completely across then large bowel we have ostra which is partially across and then we have large bowel gas so if there's a small bowel obstruction the large bowel gas is going to be absent then if it's the large bowel obstruction the large bowel gas is going to present but not in rectum then 
number of loops there are many in small bowel obstruction whilst there are few in large bowel obstruction then fluid levels in small bowel obstruction there are many and they are short then for large bowel obstruction there are few and they are long okay so this is what we have just been talking about previously okay you can pause the video and go through then management for uh intestinal obstruction of course you have to admit then you do a resuscitation for airway or breathing to check your secretion so you keep make sure you keep the patient in a new oral then you in a zogastric tube which will prevent vomiting and also you have to do it for decompression and of course prevent aspiration then the urethrocatheter is going to monitor the output to radibo venous cannula of course then you collect blood for f uh, blood count uh, cross margins you're most likely going to do if confirmed you're going to take this patient for theater of course you have to take check for blood and you rule out any breeding abnormalities then of course you have your fluid and electrolyte replacement antibiotics so you can do empirical therapy at first so you cover gram positive and negative then of course anaerobes so this is one of the uh, examples of combinations we have ampicillin gentamicin and mentorinidazole and of course kefalosporin so but you can check for you can check at the hospitals uh, facility for the guidelines uh, uh, at the local facility you are working from since they may differ then of course your blood transfusion if if needed you can do your FFFP or test in critically ill patients so you have to check then of course I see you in system management of complications if the patient present with acute respiratory distress syndrome and DIC SIRs of course you have to take them for ICU then manage these uh, complications then if I are hypotensive you have to use your dopamine and your debutamine for the sustaination of the hypotension if the fluids fail that's when you uh, include this now the monitoring you still have to monitor vitals the tutorial your blood pressure temperature pulse then of course executives uh, you can give one of the example is uh by by sacodium but of course you can use any of it anyone which, which is available then the definitive is uh, of course is surgery prepare for immediate laparotomy which is the exploratory we are going to find out exactly which, what the cause is so this happens in our setup because we don't have uh, enough enough investigations to actually know what the cause is and to do the exact uh, management so we do for we, we go for exploratory laparotomy so that's our definitive here okay then principles of extra so after you do your extra you have to uh, find out what the exact cause is if it's adjacent you do adjacent slices if it's bands you do a band release gallstones you have to remove bovirus you have to untwist and resect obstruct the then you have to reduce gangrene you have to resect stricture you have to resect and do your stricture stricturoplast then advanced malignancy you have to bypass and then whilst we're doing the exam the extra we have to check for viability of bowel so these are some of the signs you look out for so you look out for peristalsis look out for any pulsations bleeding mesenteral and bowel or friability friable flabby muscle is seen in ischemia so make sure i take note of this and also the color is it black is it pink or dull or rasterous serosa which is seen in ischemia then also is the serosa shining so these are what you look out for in checking viability of bowels then do your complications of io so we have peritonitis hypovolemic and the septic shock we can have renal failure intra-abdominal abscess uh, moribund status and acute respiratory distress syndrome then after surgery these are some of the post-surgical complications we can have pelvic abscess subphrenic abscess bilateral of fecal fistula a based abdomen bends and uh, ischemia incision area so there are some of the post-surgical complications and then differential diagnosis we have paralytic obstruction so the obstruction and ascites so these are some of the differential diagnosis you can use and then we are done uh, thank you for watching this is this was a long video so
thank you for watching and like this video and subscribe if you haven't subscribed to the channel and hit the bell notification see you on the next video